Iran just launched a full-scale attack against Israel, and folks, the implications are significant. There's a lot we can learn from this, especially when we allow the Bible to be our guide. All right, let's get into this, folks. As many of you are aware, Iran launched a full-scale attack against Israel, and folks, the implications of this are absolutely enormous. Now, a lot of information has come our way, and there have been some recent developments that we have seen, and folks, I gotta tell you, I'm going to fill you in on all of these developments, and I wanna say this, I wanna make myself very, very clear. There is something that came across the pipe that I got wrong about 10 days ago, and I'm going to explain what I got wrong in just a second, but it all centers around what appears to be the starting point of all of this. Now, I want to make myself clear. Iran hates Israel. They have hated Israel for probably the better part of now 40 years. Prior to 1979, Iran had a great relationship with Israel, and there's a lot to be said with what happened with the Shah and everything that took place back then, but we don't have time to get into that. I think the more significant portion of our discussion as it relates to this attack centers around what Iran is saying is the cause of their action against Israel. Now, this goes back to what happened on April the 1st of this year, 2024, and an Israeli airstrike destroyed a portion of the Iranian consulate, which is actually, I'm not going to call it the Iranian consulate. People say that just to be inflammatory. It was actually referred to as or is known as the Iranian consulate annex, okay? It's an annex building that's adjacent to the main embassy in Damascus. And um, this was referred to or known as the uh, Quds Force, which is basically a part of the IRGC, uh, known as the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corpse, and 16 people were killed in this airstrike. Now, many of these people were super high ranking individuals, and perhaps the most high ranking individual that was killed here was an Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Brigadier General whose name is Muhammad Reza Zahedi. Now, him and several other IRGC officers were killed. And by the way, the fact that Zahedi was killed is a massive, massive, massive loss for Iran. And one that was so big that the only loss that they had that they considered to be as big, not even necessarily bigger, but as big, is when Soleimani was killed by um, uh, the United States of America under the time that, of course, the uh, uh, around the time that President uh, Trump was around. So there's some interesting stuff that goes with this. Iran was very infuriated by this. They were very, very angry. And there's a lot to be said about what they were doing there in Damascus in the first place. Now, when this had happened, my prediction and this is the prediction that I got wrong, was that Iran would retaliate. That was my prediction, and I didn't get that part of it wrong, but what I did get wrong was I believe that the retaliation that would take place would be through uh, what Iran normally does when they retaliate or when they initiate uh, any type of an attack, and my assumption was that they were actually going to go through their proxies. That's what I thought. Now, there are many proxies in the region near Israel that we have to talk about, uh, and we'll probably address three of the most significant proxies in the area uh, that will give us a better understanding of um, all of the technicalities of everything that we're actually seeing and everything that's going through. So with this, so the three proxies that I want to actually focus on, and there are many among, there's a lot more proxies here, but I'm going to just talk about the three main ones pertinent to our discussion. So the first of the proxies is Hamas. Now, Hamas might seem to be confusing to some people when I refer to them as a proxy of Iran because, of course, they're Sunnis, number one, and perhaps one of the more significant variables tied to this is they have never really been regarded as uh, any type of a sympathizer with anybody who happens to be a Shiite, right? And of course, we know Iran is a Shiite nation, but they have remained very close to Iran, especially in recent years, because Iran is the country that actually trained all of the uh, uh, Hamas people who did what they did on October the 7th. And the leadership of Hamas has been relatively close, or has remained relatively close to Iran because of what Iran has supplied them and what Iran has given them. Now, I want to make myself very, very clear. When we talk about all of the proxies 
that are uh, going to be mentioned today. Hamas is the, uh, I wouldn't even call them uh, the elementary school. They are the preschool of the terrorist organizations. They are the least sophisticated. They are the ones that have the most uh, mitigated or diminished ability. And some of you might say, wait, James, how in the world is that the case that they've got the least amount of ability, yet they, they did maximum damage to Israel on October the 7th? Well, first of all, they were trained by Iran to do that. That was a, a very long and involved process that was probably two years in the making, maybe a little bit more than that. But the other thing is that Israel made some serious mistakes with their security and did open up the door for all of that to happen. But there's a bigger issue involved uh, when we talk about Hamas, and that is the fact that they are still, no matter how you cut it, they are still the least trained, the least organized, and perhaps the least effective of all the terrorist organizations that I'm going to talk about today. The other thing that I should note about Hamas that's really, really important, and that is the fact that even when it comes to the weapons that they were using, the tools that they're using, all of those weapons are, in many, many cases, a second-hand type of weapons, things handed down, nothing sophisticated by any stretch of the imagination. As a matter of fact, the most sophisticated thing that they were using at the time of October the 7th may have been a few drones that were handed down to them from Iran for the specific purpose of exploiting some Israeli assets. Now, there's more to that on uh, more to that uh, in just a minute. We're going to talk about that. Uh, but before we get into that aspect, the drone aspect, I also want to bring up the fact that when you start talking about a comparison to different terrorist organizations, let's bring in the next organization, and that, of course, is going to be Hezbollah. Now, when we talk about Hezbollah, Hezbollah means the party of Allah. If you are talking about the preschool representation that I made regarding Hamas, then Hezbollah is the big daddy, okay? Hezbollah is by far, and make no mistake about it, the most well-organized terrorist organization in the Middle East. They may be one of the most powerful organizations, terrorist organizations in the world, and they are very, very, very much the big boy club. Now, one thing that I wanna do is compare both organizations to you so that you just understand some of the differences. Of course, we know that when we talk about Hezbollah, we are talking about a Shiite group which is a very, very important detail because they are uh, very closely tied to Iran. But what's even more interesting is if you look at Hamas, for example, which of course, yes, they're Sunnis. But if you look at Hamas, if you uh, were to just examine something as simple as the rockets that they launch into Israel, okay? Those rockets are homemade rockets. They dig into the ground. They pull out pipes from the ground that have the water supply that Israel provides to them and all the other things that Israel has given them through these pipes. They dig into the ground as they make their tunnels. They pull these pipes out of the ground and they cut them up and repurpose them to make these mortar type rockets. They're not accurate. Uh, they oftentimes have limited range and they do not do the kind of damage that a typical traditional missile that has guidance systems might do. And let's just give some comparisons here because when you start talking about the rockets that uh, Hamas has, which is pretty much all they have when it comes to things similar to this, let's just pretend right now Hamas has 30,000 rockets, okay? Understand this, Hezbollah, if you were, and I'm giving you an arbitrary number, Hezbollah then has 250,000 to 300,000 missiles. So that shows you how much bigger Hezbollah is compared to Hamas. Very important that we point that out. The other thing that we should note is if Hamas has 250 to 300,000 missiles, not rockets, remember these are missiles that are extraordinarily sophisticated, they are powerful, they are capable of significant long range, and they actually have guidance systems that are even based on satellite locations. This is no joke. They're very, very, very complicated compared to anything that you're going to see coming out of Hamas territory, and an overwhelming majority of these missiles are manufactured by none other than uh, Iran, okay? It's it, very important we notice that. Now, there is some Russian technology tied to this, but that's for a later discussion on another day. So my thought was that we were going to see some form of retaliation from Hezbollah and maybe Hamas seeking to do something distracting as Israel has been preparing to go into uh, has been uh, prepared been preparing to go into the south, which of course is Rafa. Now 
The other terrorist organization that I want to talk about is at the southern peninsula, or the southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula, which of course is Yemen. Now there's a couple of countries that are in the southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula, the southern border of Saudi Arabia that we should talk about. One of course is Oman, but Oman is not significant to the narrative that we're having right now because Oman is going to be, actually if you want to talk about the significance of Oman, Oman is going to be a lot more significant to uh, the Arabian Sea that of course is going to be further east from Oman, and of course, all of the area around the Persian Gulf. So when you start looking at countries like Abu Dhabi, uh, the UAE, uh, Doha, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, uh, a lot of those areas, Iran to the north, of course, um, slightly to the north, and of course, uh, to the east, uh, Pakistan, uh, those are going to be very, very significant, right? Uh, especially when we start having the discussion about Oman. But the more significant discussion is, of course, Yemen. Now, when we talk about Yemen, which of course, if you were to look at the Arabian Peninsula, this would be the southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula that is on the, uh, what we would look at as saying the western end of it, okay? Um, if you were to look at that sort of uh, southern western tip of Yemen and you cross the way, you're actually into Djibouti, okay? So this is very interesting because below the area of Yemen is that body of water that we call the Gulf of Aden, which leads us, of course, into the Red Sea. Now, this brings us to the third terrorist proxy, and that is uh, the Yemeni Houthis. Now, they are, of course, another very well-organized terrorist organization. I would say that they're more organized uh, than Hamas is, and they have a little bit further of a reach in that they have available to them a lot more extensive, uh, extensively complicated type of weapons that Iran has provided for them. And so my mistake was that I assumed that the Yemeni Houthis uh, Hamas partially, and of course, uh, Hezbollah would be the terrorist organizations that would attack. And my general assumption was that what we would see is we would see an attack uh, prominently from the northern uh, part of Israel, which would be southern Lebanon, and that um, it would become a very aggressive attack, and that any attacks that came from the south would be as a result of anything that would have been launched from Yemen. And we know that lots of drones probably would have been launched from Yemen, lots of missiles would be launched from Yemen, and yes, they do have the capacity capacity to go across the Arabian Peninsula and, of course, into Israel. Um, and there's where uh, my mistake was made because my general assumption is that Iran would react that way. And you have to understand, with the bombing of this IRGC building, right, the, the, uh, the building that housed all of these uh, Quds uh, forces, you need to understand um, this would have been a massive, massive, massive blow to Iran in another uh, respect, because if you look at Damascus, where the building is located, and you were to just look at the map where Damascus is, and you were to go further west on that map, then you would notice that you come right into Beirut. Now, the thing that's really interesting is that would have created a significant pathway, and they've been working hard to create a significant pathway to allow another source or a point of entry for Hezbollah to come into uh, Lebanon so that they can travel further south and line the border that's um, what we would call the eastern border of Lebanon and the western border of Syria to secure their, in, their uh, interests as they uh, seek to or aim to affect what was going on in Israel. Now, this becomes really important because if you go further south from Damascus and you follow the, the Syrian border all the way south, that brings you into this um, little area known as the Golan Heights. Now, when we talk about the Golan Heights, a lot of people associate the Golan Heights with just simply Israel, but that isn't the case because there is an Israeli section of the Golan Heights, and then, of course, there is a Syrian section of the Golan Heights. And and we know that Hezbollah has some positions uh, that they are not really being active in right now, but eventually will become active where the Golan Heights is on the Syria side. But the reason why you don't see a lot of Hezbollah activity in that area is because Russia has been very prominent in that region because they have claimed that both the Syrian side and the Israeli side of the Golan Heights should belong to them. That's another complication for another day. And there is a lot of room for discussion regarding that issue. Uh, but for the purposes of this discussion and the update on what's going on with the war, we're not gonna get into it. Now, believe me, there's very, 
very pertinent warrant information that's going to come to you in just a second, but I want you to be able to have the background of all of this. And I think that the background is really, really critical because I cannot provide healthy analysis for what's going on unless you understand the background of all of this. So what is absolutely shocking here and what has uh, surprised all of us is the fact that instead of Iran ordering their proxies to act on behalf uh, of them as a nation and Hezbollah getting involved, Hamas getting involved, and the Yemeni Houthis, we actually witnessed Iran itself launch a full-scale attack. Now, this is significant for several reasons. The first reason why this is significant is because this has never happened in the history of the reestablished nation of Israel and Iran. As a matter of fact, what's uh, really even more unique is the fact that Israel has a long history of a close relationship with the Persian people for many, many years, even back into ancient days. So this is why this is such a, an extraordinary thing in that this is the very first time that Iran has actually launched a full-scale attack against Israel. We've never seen that happen before. As a matter of fact, prior to 1979, Israel was very, very close to Iran. And uh, matter of fact, Iran was the place that Israelis would go to to vacation. And no joke, like I'm, I'm not even messing around with this. So this is kind of an important development and one that we have to consider for just a moment. Now, with that said, what happened here was literally unprecedented. We believe that anywhere from three to 500 drones were launched from Iran. Now, the media is going to tell you somewhere around 300. We believe it was close, for, uh, close to between three to 500 drones and anywhere from 100 to 200 missiles that were launched. Now, when the drones are launched, Israel is going to have a lot of time to react. And I should note the fact that Israel heavily modified their Iron Dome system to be able to deal with the uh, threat of Iranian drones coming into their airspace. And uh, very effectively, we saw a demonstration of that uh, in the last uh, 48 hours or so, okay? Um, so because of October the 7th, Israel had shored up their capabilities with the Iron Dome in dealing with these drones that were coming towards Israel. So that's one thing we should keep in mind. But as these drones start heading towards Israel, remember, they're low and they're very slow. So they're, they're traveling at a very low uh, altitude. And as they're traveling at that altitude, they are not necessarily easy to detect. But if they can be detected, they're not going to be very difficult to deal with because of the speed and the, um, the altitude that, that they're at, okay? And the Iron Dome system knows how to deal with that. But when they got around the halfway point to their destination, and by the way, these drones were headed towards um, all kinds of targets, right? They were headed towards uh, Jerusalem. Uh, some of these uh, missiles that ended up getting launched were appointed right at the Temple Mount area. Like, no joke, folks. Like, it's serious, right? So Iran not only launches these drones, when these drones get about halfway into their destination, then they launch many of their missiles. And these missiles have ICBM capability and have the capacity to hold massively large warheads, okay? So these missiles are serious, they're sophisticated, and these missiles travel low, way lower than the drones do, and uh, very, 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 very fast. So the drones will go low and slow. These missiles will go low and fast, and they can hug the surface of where they're traveling in order to get to where they need to get to. And oftentimes, before they hit their targets, what they end up doing is they end up dolphining kind of up. And as they kind of go up, they reach the altitude necessary in order to come down on where it needs to attack. And it's a very, very effective tool. And these types of missiles have grown in sophistication, and they do things like this. So. This is what this was the intent, and this is exactly what they were doing. And by the way, some of these missiles are capable of, you know, breaking Mach 1, Mach 2, and in many cases, even faster than that. They're going faster than some fighter jets, uh, which is uh, pretty amazing. And I don't have the exact specifics, which is why I won't get into the exact mile per hour, but I know that they are significantly fast and they can go extraordinarily fast here. Okay. So, it's what's interesting and what should be noted um, is the fact that they did this. And of course, here's the good news. And I want to make myself very, very clear. This is such a blessing. And this is, again, the hand of God protecting his people and uh, a real testimony to the wisdom that Israel has had, the dedication of their people in developing great technology. Uh, literally over 99% of every single thing that targeted Israel did not make it. They were intercepted. It was uh, not successful. As a matter of fact, the only casualty that we know of 
is a seven-year-old uh, little girl, uh, a Bedouin Arab girl who was uh, seriously wounded in southern Israel. Uh, that was as a result of some shrapnel that was actually launched. And again, we thank God for the fact that uh, that was the case and that the attack was minimized. So we're very happy with the good news that we received concerning the fact that Israel was able to stop all of this. But let me tell you why I am very concerned. There are two major concerns that I have with this. The first concern that I have is obvious, and that is for the Iranian people. I am concerned for Iran. I think that Israel is going to respond aggressively. I think they're going to respond powerfully. And anytime a nation positions itself against Israel, that's never going to end well for the nation that positions itself against Israel. Remember, God made it very clear. He said, look, you look up at the moon and the sun and the stars. If they're still there, then so will my people be. Just like those ordinances will always remain, so will my people be. So there's no way Israel is going to be removed off the face of the earth, okay? They're going to be uh, upheld by God and God is going to protect their existence. And that's a very, very important thing, which makes me very concerned for the Iranian people. And I'll tell you why. Because there are so many Persians that I have met that are extraordinarily wonderful people. They are some of the kindest, uh, most intelligent, articulate, wonderful people you're ever going to meet. They care about the humanity around them. And so many of them are people that have made a substantial difference in this world. And we have a lot, a lot of Persians living in this country. And I'm grateful for their presence in this country. Many of them have made a substantial difference. And I know personally many of them that have uh, been a blessing to me and in my life. So I am worried about the, uh, about the people that are in Iran, especially considering the fact that the largest growing portion of the Christian church right now is found in Iran. The largest growing Christian church is in Iran. It's a pretty significant thing to think about. So yes, I'm naturally worried about Iran. The other thing that I'm worried about is I'm worried about the United States of America, significantly worried about the United States of America, because one of the first things that Joe Biden does, right, is he says, Israel, you successfully defended yourself. So we're not going to back you up if you attack Iran. Okay, first of all, that's offensive. That's ridiculous. It All that does is hurts the citizens of the United States of America by telling Israel something like that. And to make things even worse, Joe Biden ought to be ashamed of himself and his regime because it was him and his regime that funded Iran in the first place with the money that was necessary in order for them to do what they did in the attack that they made on Israel. Let's make ourselves very clear here. The United States of America is headed for even more judgment than it has already received. And a large part of the judgment that we've had in the last several years has been the very fact that he's allowed Joe Biden to stay in office. And we're going to continue to see more judgment like this. And it's very sad. And it makes me very worried because I love my country and I'm very concerned about the direction that our country is going in. It's, a, it's deeply disconcerting to me. And I'm very, very worried. Okay. So I'm worried about those two things. Now, with that said, there are three things that we need to pay attention to. This is very, very significant on three levels, okay? And all of them, by the way, are very important, okay? The first reason why this is significant is one that I've already talked about, and I think it's important to reiterate. And that is a fact that this attack, contrary to what my belief was 10 days ago, this attack was initiated by Iran and not Iran's proxies. Okay, this is radically significant because what this will end up doing is this will end up contributing to the massive change in the geopolitical infrastructure that has to take place uh, in order for us to see what we know is going to happen in Ezekiel 38. I do not believe that the geopolitics of what is uh, sort of going to be in the Ezekiel 38 time or what needs to happen geopolitically to create Ezekiel 38 could have happened if Iran did not attack Israel. So we are watching a major door opening here. Now, is this Ezekiel 38? No, clearly not. And that is because the second thing that I need you to pay attention of or pay attention to concerning all three things that have happened, happened. And this one is huge, folks. This one tells us that we are not in the same Middle East that we used to be in. This one is so big that it should be earth-shattering to those of us that study Bible prophecy, okay? 
This is the reason why I know we're not talking about Ezekiel 38 here, all right? The moment those drones got launched and the missiles got launched, many of them never even made it into Israeli airspace. And the reason why they did not make it into Israeli airspace is because the kingdom of Saudi Arabia chose to militarily get themselves involved in this situation by intervening and shooting down these drones and these missiles, several of them. And they made no quirks about the fact that they were responsible for shooting those down because they recognized not only the security problem for their own country, but recognized the security problem for Israel and were not apologetic about uh, assisting Israel in defending Israel from the attacks that were being lobbied towards them. Now, of course, there's a lot more significance to this in that, of course, when Saudi Arabia did this, um, it would be bas basically history-making. It is precedent-making. But the reason why I say I know that this is in Ezekiel 38 is, well, two things. I know Ezekiel 38 takes place after the rapture. But the other thing that is really interesting is Ezekiel 38 tells us that Saudi Arabia will object to the attack uh, the attacks of the conglomerate of nations that attack Israel, um, but we know that they will only verbally object, but there won't be any military intervention. Here, there's some military intervention taking place. But that is really important, right? It's important to notice that Saudi Arabia has gotten involved. By the way, here's the other part of this point number two the, of the three things that we need to watch. Jordan got involved as well. Jordan actually chose to also intercept many of these missiles and uh, these drones. So both Jordan and Saudi Arabia both unapologetically acknowledge the fact that they got involved in order to do what they were going to do. And it's interesting coming from uh, Riyadh and of course coming from Amman that they are going to uh, both say that they're getting involved and they're doing what they're doing in aid of Israel. That is unprecedented. It shows us that we are in a completely different Middle East. Now here's the third reason why this is extraordinary. And this is going to be something that's gonna set off an aspect of this conversation that you very much need to hear. And that is this. Russia almost immediately chimed in and Russia basically said very clearly, they were very clear about this. They said that if Israel were to attack Iran, if Israel attacks Iran, then Russia would back Iran. Okay. Now that is significant for a lot of reasons. Okay. First of all, let's bring this back to something very, very important, and that's an aspect that I've been talking about for a while, but we have not maybe talked about maybe in the last few months, and that is what happened to the Yemeni Houthis when the United States of America received its new president, President Biden. One of the very things that President, one of the very first things that President Biden did with his State Department, right, um, was he declared the Yemeni Houthis as non-combatants. They were no longer regarded as a terrorist organization. Now, the reason why that becomes very significant is because it really, really upset Saudi Arabia. So why does that become a big deal to Saudi Arabia? It becomes a big deal to Saudi Arabia because they are infuriated over that decision by the United States of America. Because if you remember, Saudi Arabia has gone out of their way to purchase a whole bunch of military equipment from the United States of America. Now, here's one aspect of military purchases that we don't necessarily know because it isn't widely spoken about, and that is this. If you buy military equipment that was manufactured in, let's say, the United States of America, the United States of America will sell it to you if you're, your, you're their ally, but they will do it under one very important clause, and that is you are not allowed to use the weapons that you buy from America to, of course, attack America. And you're not allowed to buy the weapons or use the weapons that you buy from America to attack any allies of America or anybody that America declares as non-combatants. So when Saudi Arabia bought all of their weapons from the United States of America, they chose to use those weapons, including parts of the Patriot missile system, in order to protect their interests and to protect their security 
And when the Yemeni Houthis start running amok in the southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula, especially as we start getting uh, closer to the area that is uh, directly across Eritrea and uh, Djibouti and some of these other areas further south into the Red Sea, you have to keep in mind, Saudi Arabia is deeply affected by that because Saudi Arabia can no longer use the weapons that they purchased from the United States of America to defend themselves. And so that created even a bigger problem. And if you remember, the United States of America was actually told by Saudi Arabia to get lost because when they did this and Saudi Arabia was no longer able to do what they were, uh, what they wanted to do with the weapons that they purchased from the United States of America, they ended up going to Russia. They ran into Russia's arms. Russia sold them all kinds of military equipment. Russia sold them all kinds of stuff that they knew Saudi Arabia would need to have in order to defend themselves. And on top of that, folks, Russia basically told Saudi Arabia, don't worry about the Yemeni Houthis. We will come up with an equitable solution as we work with Iran to make sure they're not a problem. Now, this is where it becomes very complex. With Russia ending up saying that they were going to back Iran, Saudi Arabia just created a problem for itself because it's very likely that the weapons that were utilized in intercepting the drones and the missiles by Saudi Arabia were probably Russian equipment, right? They were probably using S-300, S-400s. They were probably using a bunch of things that were Russian in order to defeat this. And of course, that may be very true with Jordan. Um, uh, of course, Jordan has a whole series of different types of weapons that aren't just uh, Russian. As a matter of fact, there's a smaller percentage of Russian weapons in Jordan than there are uh, other weapons. But the reality of all of this is this is going to eventually become a serious problem for Saudi Arabia because it may put them at odds with Russia. Now, let me say this. It may put them at odds with Russia. We just don't know, right? We just, we're completely unaware of what it's going to do. All of this to simply say, and this is really important, there's several things we have to be looking at, okay? We have to be paying attention to what's going on right now with all of these countries that are in or near the Arabian Peninsula. We have to pay attention to Iran. We have to pay attention to Iraq. We have to pay attention to Syria. We have to pay attention to Jordan. We have to pay attention, of course, to Israel and Lebanon. We also have to pay attention now to Egypt. We have to pay attention to all of the countries that border the Red Sea. So we have to pay attention to what's going on with Sudan, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Djibouti, uh, Somalia, especially Somalia, and even parts of Kenya as uh, we get into the area of the Indian Ocean. And of course, further north of the Indian Ocean into the Arabian Sea, there's some big implications that may affect trade as it comes from Pakistan, right? And of course, I would also be paying attention to what happens coming out of Kandahar in Afghanistan, especially in relationship to what's going on in Iran. And of course, in Afghanistan, we know that we have a massive population of people that are representing, are represented uh, from Iran, Iraq, uh, some Syria, but more significantly, China and Russia. They're all in Afghanistan right now, and that can create some very serious security concerns, especially when you start looking further north and what may become a problem with Turkey. And I don't even have time to get into the issue with Turkey and what's going on in the Mediterranean and what's happening over there. But folks, it is significant. And with Russia, having all kinds of assets in the Red Sea and of course having a significant amount of assets right now in Libya because remember they're gunning for the southern Mediterranean that's exactly what they're doing and understand they are very likely going to win this civil war that's going on in Libya which creates even more complexities especially for the border between Libya and Egypt and of course for these little tiny towns uh, known as Tripoli or Benghazi they are going to create some complexities like you won't even believe, especially if the country you're living in is Tunisia, you're gonna see some really interesting things. And as you go further north from the Southern Mediterranean into Greece, or uh, even if you go north uh, east into Cyprus, or you uh, you know even go further north into Malta, or you get into Rome, you're gonna have some real problems. And these are all things that are gonna be created by what Russia is doing. Russia ain't going anywhere. Okay, I'm gonna tell you that right now. They're not going anywhere right now. And it's a really, really important thing to also be paying attention to. So I would be looking at all of that. I would keep your antennas up for looking at activity in any of these countries. I would also 
ask you to pay special attention to North Korea. North Korea is going to become significant here uh, for more reasons than one. And if you begin to see heightened activity in North Korea, then really be on your guard because that means we're going to start seeing some more movement with respect to Iran and very likely what's happening uh, in the Persian Gulf. We're going to see some major changes. Yes, China is one to watch, but not nearly as much as uh, what we're going to see coming out of North Korea and some of these other areas that are friendly to Iran, it is a significant issue. So there you go. That gives you some uh, a good, solid understanding of all the things that are happening geopolitically, and hopefully it will help you better understand what's going on. We will, by the way, oh, throughout this week, give you a bunch of updates on what's going on and what all of it means. We'll do some analysis. Tomorrow I'll be live uh, with David Tall, and we'll get into a very, very poignant discussion about what to expect and what to be going on. We're going to do some things with Countdown to Eternity to update you a little bit more on everything that's happening in Israel, and of course, uh, on my live show. We'll spend some time discussing that as well. So a lot of work ahead of us. We are excited about it. And I've got a very special show planned for you on Friday that is going to talk about um, what's happened in Israel and what it has to do with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Yes, that's the one of the rapture passages. Really important to talk about. Actually, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but it's all very important stuff. All right. So with that, there you go. You've got a pretty good summary. Hopefully this has been helpful. Love you guys. God bless you. Oh, and I do want to mention one other thing. Please, please, please go to some of the videos that I have done on this subject. I have an interview between me and uh, Benjamin uh, Netanyahu's brother, Idu Netanyahu, that you can go to. There's a really good information that's there. And also uh, there is another video, and I'll put these up at the very end. There's also another video that I did that relates to Iran when Iran spoke at the UN um, General Assembly and some of the things that we learned from what they had to say there. Uh, very important. And actually that gets into some of the complexities with um, uh, what's happening with Turkey and Azerbaijan and of course Armenia and we've got a lot of things that we discuss in that video and you can get some really good solid background especially if you want to acclimate yourself a little closer to the geopolitics of the region okay so there you go hopefully this is helpful love you guys god bless you